Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Keith, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, really grateful to be here. Um, yeah, I'm not going to lie, I was a little stressed out before I came. Uh, I was just leaving her brother's birthday party over in Brentwood, and... Uh, at one of those little jumpy places, and she was not happy to leave, and she was screaming the whole way here, my check engine light came on, and I was supposed to get my car smog Monday, and I was freaking out for a minute, you know what I mean, and, uh, you know, in the past, I would have drove straight home, I would have called the person that asked me to speak, and be like, hey, you know, I would have lied, and said something came up, and I just wouldn't have showed up, you know, and uh, that's how I spend a lot of my life, you know, uh, being dishonest, running from things that scared me or things that made me uncomfortable. But uh, thanks to this program, um, it showed me a new way to live, and it's definitely a better way for me. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, yeah. Um, what it was like for me, I grew up with uh, both my parents were alcoholics and addicts. Um, but when I was about four years old, one of them decided to get clean and sober. And, uh, you know, growing up, and two different households like that, it's 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 a struggle going back and forth. You know, uh, the family or my mom who decided to get clean and sober, you know, I had a lot of structure in my life. Um, I was told and learned from an early age that um, <laughs> drugs and alcohol were bad and I should never do them. Um, it wasn't forced down my throat, but it definitely felt like something that, you know, I should never touch, but knowing that it uh really there was a lot of intrigue to it at that point, you know it made me really um curious about it and i I grew to kind of be defiant and I kind of looked at it as a way um I really wanted to be sneaky and get away with stuff uh like I hear a lot of us do and uh so going back and forth between uh, both parents' households, it was okay from a pretty early age to drink at my dad's house. Um, he would buy me alcohol. It was okay to, you know, smoke marijuana in the house. So I started looking forward to, to going over there on the weekends and stuff. And, you know, um, having one parent that's sober, uh, it's really not easy to hide that type of stuff from them. You know what I mean? And I had a lot of guilt and shame, um, lying and being dishonest, but I like to do it, and it felt like an escape for me, you know, and so it's something I continue to do, um, regardless of the consequences and regardless of who I hurt and, you know, trust that I lost. It was just, you know, something that I was still okay with doing. It didn't feel good, but um, I continued to do it because it's, you know, it was the only way I knew how to cope and get by, Um I did feel a little different growing up, you know, I felt, um, I, I got along with most people, you know, I, I, I was a chameleon, I can get along with a whole bunch of different crowds, you know, I played sports, I was in, uh, I was in honors classes and stuff, but I would still, you know, during lunch and after school and before sports games, I would still like to go get drunk and get high, and, uh, you know, I, I kind of started noticing the differences in high school, you know, when I have to give like a 10 minute oral presentation for an AP English class and I'm the only one getting drunk before going to do that. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, early on there wasn't a whole bunch of consequences, but they, they started coming, you know, um, like with, uh, losing the trust of my mom, you know, over and over again, uh, I was told that it wasn't okay to get drunk and get high in her house, and I continued to do that until it led to the point where, you know, I had the ultimatum, and I chose to move out and uh, live with my dad, and I thought it was going to be, you know, perfect, you know, um, there wasn't any rules, there wasn't any consequences, and, and uh, you know, I thought it was going to be perfect, thank you. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, um, I centered uh, my whole life around um, drinking, uh, wanting to get more alcohol, wanting to get more drugs, you know, and uh, nothing else mattered. And, uh, you know, things 
continued to get worse and worse, you know. Um, all my career choices, uh, I wanted to be a pharmacy tech because, you know, <laughs> who doesn't want to be around drugs, you know, when you, that, that really didn't go so hot, you know. Um, I was a bartender. It's just like anything I can do to get drugs and alcohol, that's, that's all I was about, you know. I would hang around people I would never in a million years hang out with, you know, and uh, I always told myself that it was okay and that I had it, you know, that everything was under control, you know. I was like, oh, I have a roof over my head, um, you know. I can kind of pay my bills. I live with my dad, so if I don't give him rent for a couple months in a row, you know, who cares? He's drinking, too. He's probably going to forget. Um, things finally got uh, to, to the point where... Other people, <laughs> uh, other people started, you know, telling me that um, they thought I was out of control, and uh, you know, I decided to go to rehab because to please other people. I really didn't. Here, come sit down. Uh, I really didn't think I needed it at the time, you know, no matter how bad things were at the time. But uh, I decided to go. Um, I was there for about five days when I found out that um, I was going to have a kid. And uh, I didn't even know the girl, a couple months maybe. Um, but I thought that that was going to keep me sober. You know, I was like, you know, if you have a kid on the way. That's exactly what you need to keep you sober. Like, this is like, this is God putting this in your life. And, uh, you know, I listened to what they said. And having a parent that was in uh, AA, oh, thank you. Um, you know, I, I knew what to say, you know, to keep people happy, and, uh, and like, can you go there? <laughs> and so, um, but like I said, I didn't do what was suggested, and uh, it took me about a month of getting out, and I, you know, was still around her mom that was uh, still in the disease, and um, it didn't take me about a month of getting out of rehab, and I relapsed, and like people said, you know, things kept getting worse, and you know, like I said, I had always had a roof over my head and I thought everything was okay. Um, all those things changed, you know, like it got to the point where everyone was tired of my shit and I didn't have anywhere, anywhere to go. Um, you know, and I was the type of person, like never in a million years, did I ever think I was going to be homeless or anything like that. And, uh, I decided that, you know, I should, I should go back to rehab. And I went the second time and I listened a little bit more and, um, I took more suggestions, but still, like, I didn't jump in with both feet. You know, I still had my reservations, and, uh, you know, that that led me to relapse again. And that, at that point is when I really just realized that I should be taking suggestions of, you know, people in the rooms. And you see so many examples of people this has worked for, so it's like continuing to keep doing what I think is the best thing is the wrong idea, you know. And I finally really started listening to other people, and... um Really just like trusting in my higher power. Um, I always believed in God, but I never really um, knew how to turn my will and my life over to God. And, uh, you know, once I did that, things got so much easier for me. You know, um, I got a sponsor. Um, I know that the things I should be telling my sponsor are the things. If I feel like I shouldn't be telling my sponsor things, those are exactly the things I need to be telling them. And uh, if I have, like, life decisions uh, or, you know, things that come up, I need to run it by them. Um, and like I said, <laughs> thank you. And like I said, with trust in my higher power, like, just an example. Is, um, on Monday, I had a friend who uh, get, had a job opportunity that he offered me. And I was, it, it was a better opportunity than the, than the job I had. And, uh, you know, I've been wanting to get out of my job for a while. They, you know. I'm getting put on graveyard back and forth, and it's just, I didn't feel like it's the best place for um, yeah. for my recovery and for staying sober, and I was really scared, and I wasn't going to apply, and I got back from from my home group meeting on Tuesday, and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to do it, and then yesterday, I'm at work, and they have a meeting, and they tell me my company's moving to Ohio, and that we're going to be closing yeah. down in two months, and it was just like, man, I was so scared and freaked out about doing this thing, but you know, like I said, I trusted my higher power, and I'm like, you know, I feel like this is the right thing. Like I said, I I talked to my sponsor about it, and it's just like, it was just such a God shot, and it just like gave me so much, so much faith, you know, in God and the rooms and just like the life that, that AA has given me, and um, that it's okay to walk through your fears. I used to run from everything, you know, my feelings, 
anything, like I said, that scared me or made me uncomfortable, I would bolt. And so, you know, just at times getting that reassurance that, you know, I'm on the right path and that if I continue to do the things I do, um, I'm going to be okay and God is going to have me right where he needs me to be. And, um, you know, I have only this program to thank for that. So thank you guys. Hi, I'm Janice. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Janice. There's a lot of you, <laughs> and I'm very nervous. Um, and I, I can say that because I have um, sponsors that taught me to be honest. And so I'm going to do my best to be honest in front of a group full of strangers, but who are also my kin. Um, my sobriety date is April 22nd, 2003. I work with a sponsor. I work with a sponsee. I have a home group. Uh, in San Francisco, it's the YMCA Embarcadero Group. We meet around 1210, Monday through Friday. Come visit us. That's where I met this gentleman here. He asked me to speak, and so here I am. So thank you for letting me be of service today. Um, so I'll, I'll just follow the same format because I'm nervous as shit, and it'll keep me on track. Otherwise, I'll just do a head vomit, and it won't make much sense. Um, so what it was like, uh, for me, uh, what it was like, um, it wasn't a very long career in drinking and using, um, but I started when I was 14. And I started when I was 14 because I grew up in an alcoholic, abusive home. And the kind of home I lived in was my uncle was an emergency room nurse, and he was an alcoholic. And he thought he would try his hand at um, having a meth lab of his own in the garage. He also kept guns in the house, playboys at the ready, and porno tapes out. My dad was non-existent because he was young, and he was left with three kids after my mother had died two months after my second birthday. Um, so it, I wasn't set up for success. Um, also, my new stepmother was Catholic, and my grandmother was Jehovah's Witness. So... Um, I was at a little pawn. They are trying to see who was going to convert me first. So I was very confused. I was very scared. And I was in a house full of men. Um, and it just didn't make any sense. Um, so I did not feel safe. I didn't even feel safe at home. I didn't feel safe with people who were supposed to protect me. Um, dinner time was the worst time because I had to sit through um, dinner with these two men who were blistering drunk. Um, it usually ended with my uncle throwing the dishes because we didn't want to eat whatever he cooked. Um, usually what he cooked was burnt. Um, so I would just try to keep the food down and try my best not to cry. Um, so that, that was, um, that was my house. <laughs> uh, so that, that's my experience with, with alcohols and, and alcohol and drugs, right? Um, and I swore I would, I would never be the men in my life. Um, I didn't want to be like them. Uh, they were just, they were just really bad people. And so because my dad and my uncle were so, so bad, um, and because my dad felt so cheated by life, you know, he was left with these three kids and no mother to care for them. Um, he made it known on a daily basis that we were unwanted and that we were stupid and that we would grow up to be nothing. And so because of that, I thought, well, I'm, I might as well behave as such. Um, so I did. I did. Uh, I really didn't think I was smart. Um, I thought I didn't know what I was going to be when I grew up. I, I didn't think that far ahead. Um, I started cutting classes in junior high. I started rolling with people who... Um, Smoked cigarettes, smoked weed, got drunk, uh, and I thought this is my this is my lot in life. This is who I'm going to be, and I really didn't think um, I really didn't think much of it. Um, so I continued this way um, up until I don't know maybe 15. Uh, my dad was getting sued by his first wife for child support, so we moved in with her because he thought that maybe he could have a go at it instead of paying child support. When we moved in with my first stepmother, this would have been my third high school because my dad just couldn't get his shit together. Uh, 
But uh, when I ended up in Vallejo, I was like, I'm amongst my people. You know, ghetto as fuck. I like it here. And I cleaned up my act somehow. It wasn't until I graduated high school and I thought I could go to college and be an adult did I realize that I didn't have the tools to be an adult. I wasn't given those skills by my dad. I definitely wasn't given those skills by my grandmother. So whatever job I got, um, I really didn't show up. I really wasn't accountable. I wasn't responsible. I didn't know how to balance a checkbook. I didn't know what a FICO score was. Um, I just was. I just managed. Uh, I went to school at night. I went to work full-time during the day. Um, and Friday afternoon, come five o'clock, I would get drunk with my coworkers. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, I could hold down alcohol very well. I think I could probably drink three Cosmos and then I'm done. I'm, I'm on the ground. Like my coworkers are peeling me off the floor and then dumping me in my boyfriend's house. And the sun hasn't even gone down yet. And come Monday, I would just be really cute and try to get away with it again the following weekend. So um, I don't think my drinking career was that fun. It was just a means to get by. It was just a means for me to just try to fit in. Because that's what I really wanted, right? I really wanted to fit in in this universe because I didn't know my place, even as an adult. Yeah, I went to school. Yeah, I got a paycheck. Um, but none of it made sense. I didn't know what it is I was trying to do. Um that grandmother I told you about, that Jehovah's Witness, she passed away t 2002. And um, she was what I thought at the time, um, my true mother, the one that raised me, the one that brought me up. And I was devastated. And um, in order to cope, uh, my drinking picked up. And I would just end up going to work hungover. I would call in sick all the time. And my employers let me get away with it. They thought that, you know, she's just grieving, but there was something else there. I, I didn't know, but there was something else there. And um, at the time, I was working for a Johnson & Johnson company, so all the things I needed were at my disposal, like a non-site therapist. So my supervisor sent me to the therapist, and she said, oh, you're grieving, you're going through depression. You know, we'll, we'll do a few sessions on site, and then I'll, I'll refer you out. So she referred me out, and I saw another therapist, and... I told her my story, and I remember walking in, and I had a beanie on and all these clothes on, but I was freezing, and I was shaking, and I had to sit on my hands to stop from shaking, and um, I don't know why. It wasn't like I was drunk or hungover. I, I, was, I, guess, I guess I wasn't ready, right? And she wanted to talk about my childhood, and I thought it was, it was fine. I'm here, I'm here to talk about grief. I'm here to talk about death. I'm here to talk about my grandmother. Why do we want to talk about my childhood? But she kept digging, and she kept poking, and I didn't really care for it. So I didn't see her after maybe four sessions. I was done. Um, I continued to drink, um, fuck around, took a semester off from college. And, um, you know, my friends, they co-signed it all. They said, um, you know, it's okay. You're just going through it. But... I knew somewhere deep down inside it was not okay. I just didn't know what. I didn't know what was wrong. Um, so I assumed I was fucking crazy. I, I must be crazy. I'm going to die alone. I'm going to die alone. I'm be worse off than Pops and Uncle, those two losers. I'm going to be worse than them. Um, one night I went to Mission Rock in San Francisco, and I got really, really drunk in the parking lot. And I had my cousin and my best friend with me, and I, I blacked out like I always do. And I drove them home that night. I don't know how I got us home to San Jose. I had to pull over into one of those, like, pullover things with a truck stop. I had to take a nap. I couldn't drive. My friends couldn't, my, my cousin and my, my best friend couldn't drive a stick. So I had to sleep. And she woke me up an hour later. She's like, come on, we gotta go home, man. We gotta go home. And I went home and I, Went to bed, and the next morning, phone calls and text messages came through, and I was mortified by my behavior. Um, I tried making out with everyone at that club, and at the time, I was I was seeing someone. I was making out with my boyfriend's friends. I was making out, trying to make out with my other best friend. I was dancing on tables. Uh, 
I thought I was so cute. I wore like this see-through black top with a black bra, black lipstick, and Princess Leia buns. I thought I was the, I thought I was so cute. And I was not, I was not cute. I was not. And no, and no one picked up my phone calls after that. I was so desperate. I, I, I apologized. I said, sorry, right? I said, sorry, right? What else do you want me to do? Um, so I, I called that therapist and I said, Hey, you know, remember that one time you asked me about my drinking? I think, I think you're onto something. So what do we, what do we do, man? Do I, do I see you every day? Do we go, do we work out of a workbook? Like I could do that. I could do that. It's just, no, you, you have to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, and I said, what? Because my only experience with you guys was whatever I saw on TV or whatever I saw in movies. And it always portrayed us in dark, damp, smoky basements, you know, with one fucking light bulb. <laughs> and I thought, I have to do that. I have to do that. Um, she's like, yeah, I have to do that. I need to continue seeing me. And so um, I remember it was a Sunday morning, and it was raining, and it was Kaiser Hospital in Santa Clara, and I was sitting in that parking lot, and every person that came out of their car was, in my mind, this is how I remembered it, my young punk ass remembered everyone had a cane or a walker. <laughs> so I called my best friend and said, bruh, I'm just going to get sober and go to work on Monday. I know it'll be fine. She's like, no, you need to get your ass in that meeting because that's it. That's all you got. And so I followed the AARP bus <laughs> into that fucking room and this, this short elderly man greeted me and he hugged me and he said hi my name is blah 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 there's cookies and donuts and coffee over here please have a seat and I, I, I remember walking in it was really dark but it smelled like Christmas uh, what the hell it smells like cookies and cinnamon and coffee and shit wow and um, I sat down in the back, like all newcomers do, and it was, a, it was a speaker meeting, but they had a podium, and every person just comes up and talks, and they did that for an hour, and I, I listened to every single person. It didn't matter the color of their skin, their age. It didn't matter what they did for work, gender, didn't matter, because I understood and related to just a little bit or a lot of whatever anyone said up there. And I was both relieved and disgusted, and I wanted to leave because I thought, I am an alcoholic. And so after the meeting was done, the guys held hands in a circle. I thought, I'm in a cult now. And they, they prayed the Lord's Prayer. I was like, they are definitely a cult. And when we were done, um, this lady approached me, and she gave me her number, and she said, call me anytime. And she whispered in my ear, I wish I was your age. And I wanted to cuss around and say, I don't know what that means, man. I'm never going to call you a lady. But I was polite to my elders. And I said, <laughs> that punk-ass attitude changed in 48 hours because still no one picked up my phone calls. And so I called that lady out of desperation. And I don't even remember what she said to me. Just the fact that she picked up meant the world to me. I did a head vomit over the phone. I don't remember what I said to her. She just listened. And I thought I was calling a loser, right? But I'm the loser. I was the loser, right? Um, she didn't end up being my sponsor. But I'm so glad she picked up because that gave me a little bit of hope and a little bit of faith that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not alone in this. Um, I continued going to meetings, but I didn't get a sponsor and one particular meeting, I remember, it was the young people's meeting at that same Santa Clara Kaiser. And it was huge. It was a huge room. It was like three times this size. A whole bunch of young people. And they were all cliquish. This is how I remember it. They were all cliquish. And they were all like shiny and beaming. And everyone was so cool. And I thought, I'm in high school again. And that was the first time I heard about the big book. And I thought, I, that's right. It is a call. It's a blue Bible this time. Um, and this guy came up and said, get off your ass, wake up for your recovery, recovery waits for no one. I thought, yeah, I'm not coming back. I'm like, I'm done. I'm so done. And so I, 
I went the next morning after school. I called everyone who would, I called everyone on my phone. I know I picked up still. So I wanted to tell them what I was up to because, you know, I'm an attention whore. I was going to tell them I was going to go back out. And I was, uh, at the time, my ex was in his car and I saw him driving around campus at San Jose State. And I was ducking behind bushes to hide. Like, Argh, just leave me in peace. And uh, I didn't know where to go. There's plenty of bars on campus, but I ended up at an Outback Steakhouse in <laughs> South San Jose. <laughs> and I, I got, like, three rum and cokes one after the other. And the waiter was like, ma'am, do you, do you want to get an appetizer? Like, do you want a blooming onion or some shit? And I thought, just keep the drinks coming, man. And I, I, it was only five drinks. Again, I'm not a heavy drinker. Five drinks. And I got in my car, and I... Call another ex, because again, I'm an attention whore, and he was like, don't ever call me again. <laughs> You're such a loser, just don't ever call me again. Um, so I came in the house, and I was crying to my best friend, and we went to a meeting. I looked up a meeting online, and I sat in the Alano Club, and I, I heard for the first time, and I felt for the first time, fear. Because now I was hearing about losing jobs, losing spouses, losing kids, losing money, losing their self-dignity, losing their self-respect, losing their teeth, losing their hair. I had not heard that I was in other meetings until then. I found out it was an NA meeting. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't, they let me blubber in that corner crying. I mean, it was like the ugly cry, like snot coming out of my nose and my hair was all like disheveled. And they didn't tell me to leave. They let me, they let me sit and stew in my sadness. And that meeting was the catalyst for change. For me. I needed to hear about that so that I can jumpstart my recovery because I was no better than them. That's what I get to look forward to. At the time, I was only 24, and I thought my life was over, but I didn't want to be them. Um, so I went to a women's meeting, again, at Santa Clara. Man, I really like that Santa Clara place. I kept going there, like, plenty of meetings. And this lady was, she shared, and she did the ugly cry, you know, again, snot and shit coming out of her face. And I raised my hand. I said I was a newcomer, and I said I needed a sponsor. And that same lady, after the meeting, came up to me, and she gave me her number. And I was surprised. I, I thought I would never do that. If that was me, I would want the attention. Why? I would never extend my hand out and help somebody else. But she did that, and she ended up being my sponsor. And I found out that I wasn't alone. I found out I wasn't unique. I found out I wasn't fucking crazy, because that's what I thought. I thought I was fucking crazy, and I was alone. She took me through most of the steps, probably up to 10. And she said, you know, I'm sorry. I'm, I can no longer be your sponsor. I'm in, I decided to stop going to meetings. And so I thought, perfect. I'm at a year sober. I don't know what to do. I, I think I'll be okay. I'm just going to white knuckle. I'll be all right. So I met someone online, a thing called Friendster. <laughs> I thought I knew I thought I had my life together right I'm gonna start dating and I moved to San Francisco and it just started to unravel again I didn't know why you know I just didn't understand why I was miserable I'm sober right I'm sober that the whole point is that I need to stop drinking and using right and um what happens? All those old character defects come about, old behaviors, old defense mechanisms. Um, and so I'm only halfway, damn it. Uh, I make it longer. I was so miserable, I ended up going back to therapy. I thought I need to go back to therapy is what I'll do. And I went to this therapist and she said, maybe you should go back to AA because things aren't working out for some reason. And so I went back. I found another Alano club in Daly City. I went to a women's meeting. I was like, there's a formula. I, I, I scored big with the women's meetings in Alano club, so I'll do that. And I met this woman, and she wanted me to be her sponsor. And I don't know, in my, in my hubris, I thought I could be her sponsor. And she's like, this isn't working out, but I know someone else. And she's willing to be my sponsor. Maybe you should talk to her. I was like, cool. Yeah, I'll go talk to her. I didn't know what that meant to go talk to her. I went to talk to this lady. 
and her name was Texas Patty. And I went to her and I said, hey, Joy told me I need to talk to you. She's like, yeah, so um, pick up that big book and open the first page and tell me what it says. And I looked down and I looked at her. I was like, it's blank, man. She's like, exactly, you don't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, take the, <laughs> take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth and start listening. And this is when I, this is my first taste of like one-liners from old timers, you know? And uh, start listening, stop talking. We're going to do the steps. You're going to be of service. You're going to start sponsoring. And I was like, I hate this woman, but I want what she got. So I continued working with Patty. I finished the 12 steps, and then I started sponsoring women. I started to be of service. I stopped thinking of myself for the most part. Um, but then, uh, then as I was on a pink cod, right? And I, I, I got into relationship after bad relationship and then other, and I was like, why? Something's not quite right. I got the job. I fixed my FICO score. My friends are picking up the phone again. So what, what is it that I'm doing wrong? And so I went back to therapy and, um, started talking about my childhood. I didn't want to. At seven years sober, I was more miserable at seven years sober than I was when I was a newcomer. It did not make any sense. I thought I did not get sober this long just to feel this miserable. And drinking and using was not an option, so I didn't know what was left for me to do. And so I continued going to meetings. I continued going to therapy. I started seeking more outside help. I was actually in two different kinds of therapy twice a week, working with my sponsor, working with sponsees, going to work, and Texas Patty just being there. The act itself, just by doing, helped me. And six months later, I, I found relief. But um, I had no hope at seven years sober. I, I thought, this, this is it for me. I'm, I'm fucked. I really am going to die alone. Um, and that was not the case. Um, it was because I surrounded myself with a bunch of old timers who pissed me off and I took their suggestions, you know, just doing the next right thing and just doing it day by day. Uh, at that point in my recovery, I realized this is no longer, um, just a program for me. Cause if I, if I think of it as a program, I think of it like work, like homework, workbook work. I'm going to graduate. You guys can give me a diploma, you know? Um, Texas Patty helped me realize it's not. It's my way of life. It's my new set of beliefs. I graduate when I pass, when I reach that, when I when I when I meet my maker. And at the time, I thought that was really morbid, but that makes sense to me because I will continue coming to these meetings. I will continue being of service. I will continue working all of these principles in all my affairs when I know that this is now my new way of life. And I didn't really fully understand that until halfway through my sobriety at seven years. Um, I think that it, it's important for me to realize that, um, when I came in here at 24, I wanted all your nine step promises. I wanted to be a lady and then I was going to leave. I was going to take from all of you and I was going to give nothing back. Um, I realized that's not how it works here. Um, I need to give what was so freely given to me because when I came here, I was bankrupt. I had no self-worth. I felt like a nothing, and I didn't have anything to give you guys, and now I do. I don't want anything in return. I will freely give myself to you if you extend your hand out and need help, because that's how it works. I'm not going to give you money or my car keys or my couch, but I'll certainly pick up the phone and take you through the steps. Um, I still continue to surround myself around people who piss me off because um, they call it like it is. I don't need someone to co-sign my bullshit. I don't need to give, I don't need someone to tell me the pretty, you know, people that, and that's fine. If people want to share about, they got the car, the girl and the job, that's fine. But that I do not relate with. I want to know the ugly. I want to know how did you deal with death? How did you deal with divorce? How did you deal with death? How did you deal with success? Because I don't know how to. 
So tell me, through your experience, how you did that. And old timers are able to do that for me. Because Texas Patty taught me this. This program did not, does not promise anything but life. And at the time, I thought that sucked. But now I realize um, I get to be present. I get to be here. I get to be alive. I'm not alone. I'm not dead. Um, I'm not a piece of shit. Nobody, like my dad, said I was. Um, I am something to someone and to myself. That uncle that had his cute little meth lab, that Breaking Bad thing going on, he is now 16 years sober, six months after me. Um, that piece of shit dad, uh, karma, you know, um, I so rely on my higher power. There was no more beautiful justice than how my father passed away. He got run over by a motorcycle in the Philippines alone. So he ended up dying alone, not me. And so um, if I just continue doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I get rewarded these nice step promises. They don't all come at once, obviously, because if they did, I would leave. They come and they go. My FICO score has gone up and down. The jobs have come and gone. The cars have come and gone. But I'm, I've learned to grow up here. I've learned to surround myself around good people because I want to be like them. And I, I hope that I'm a good person, too. Um, I want to be, um, it's cheesy, right? But you guys tell me to be cheesy. I'd rather be cheesy and a smart ass. I want to be a light to somebody else. They bring light to me. Um, I want to be choosy of the relationships I'm in. You know, you guys taught me emotional sobriety. Um, I hated that term. It's bad enough you wanted me to be clean. Now you want me to be emotionally sober? What the fuck does that mean? I got 10 minutes. We're almost there, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but there's always something for me to work on. There's always, some, there's always something which keeps me busy. I no longer strive for perfection. I strive for the willingness to keep coming here. Um, the honor and the privilege to work with another alcoholic. Um, yeah, I've gotten some really cool things, but that's that's just material things. What I've gained is like the relationships I have now and this the respect that I have from my friends now and the few family members I choose to associate with. Um, you guys taught me that I don't have to do anything. I could say no. I don't have to be everything to everyone. I don't have to be driven by this fear that you guys have to like me. So I, I abandoned that family that abandoned me. And I have my own... I have my own village that I created. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. I, Because of this program, I was able to create that village. And unknowingly, I got smart, which was crazy. Um, I'm, I am no longer in relationships that are toxic and abusive. You know, I'm with someone now um, who's a weirdo like me. And uh, we get each other. And I don't feel like... I don't feel like I need to be with him because I have to. Whereas before, I needed to be in a relationship in order to be something. My primary purpose is to stay sober and help another alcoholic. That's what drives me. It never goes away. It's very black and white, and that's the kind of person I have to be. Because if I just for a moment think that I can put my recovery second... That everything else that I've achieved or gained or whatever will slip through my fingers. It won't be tomorrow or the next week or the next month, but it will, it will guarantee be worse. Um, and I've experienced that in recovery when that, when I wasn't actively coming to meetings or working with a sponsor, I was miserable. So I don't want, I, I've done enough research to know what it's like being out there. Um, so as long as I put my recovery first, everything else that's supposed to happen, will happen. Um, you guys have also restored my faith. Um, I, I do have a higher power, but my higher power is a little bit of what everyone else has in these rooms. I hear something, I'm like, oh, I like that, I'm going to take that. Oh, I like that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to integrate that too. And, you know, it, it changes, it evolves, like me and like life. Sometimes it's, a, sometimes it's like, you know, the universe is my higher power, and sometimes it's Jason Momoa, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> But it's mine. No one else's. 
whatever gets me to these rooms, right? <laughs> whatever keeps me sober. Um, but that's the beauty of this. You know, Texas Patty also taught me that I just take all these little, little nuggets and I just leave the rest. Um, that also included my attitude. That also included my unwillingness. That also included um, thinking I knew everything. All of that. I need to leave that behind. Um, and just surround myself again amongst old timers. Um, I wish there was a secret sauce recipe to how we stay clean and sober. But there isn't. I think there's beauty in that. Because uh, I will continue to be willing. Um, I will continue to strive for this. Because I want life. I don't want the alternative. I know what the alternative is. And I will do my best as long as my higher power will allow me to. In whatever capacity um, my fellows will allow me to. My friends. The few family members I stay in touch with. I feel so honored because when I first came in here, I was a nothing. I mean, I was going to lie, cheat, and steal to get whatever you had. And now I'm a more trustworthy person. Um, and it's kind of cool. It's cool that people look to me, you know, for advice. And it's also cool if they don't take it because uh, it's none of my business what anyone thinks. I just have, I just answer to one thing and one person, and that's my higher power. That's it. So um, if there's something that resonated with you, great. If not, oh, well, there's plenty of other meetings. <laughs> Talk to your sponsor. Um, but um, thank you all for letting me be of service today. Thank you for letting me do a head vomit. Um, it, is, it is quite humbling. Um, to be up here, but also quite comforting because again, we are strangers, but you are my kin. I don't know anywhere else where I can come into a room and feel safe. Um, and I've gone to different rooms all over the world and I needed my fix with a room full of crazies like me and none of you have ever told me to leave. So thank you all for, thank you all for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.